Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And it's just the trifecta here at the International Center of Photography Museum in New York City. I am so pleased to bring to you Agnès Sir, the director of the Henri Cantier Bresson Foundation. Agnès, welcome. Thank you for receiving me. Avec plaisir. And that's it. I don't know any more French, so we're just going to make do with what we can. Well, we're here, and you're here in particular, because in two days, a major retrospective of Henri Cartier-Bresson's work, based on the book Decisive Moment, the American title, uh, which is what this represents. Now, of course, the American title is not at all what the French title was. No. What is that story? The French title is Image à la Sauvette which could be translated as images on the run, like a little seller in the streets obliged to leave because the police wants him to leave. That's how Cartier-Bresson was thinking he was photographing in the street. Yes. So this title is perfect for him. And then in English, the, the, the publishers, Simon and Schuster, were, were thinking it was not enough uh, as an advertising title. It was not enough... Uh, a coup. It was not clickbait, we would call it today. Clickbait? Clickbait. Okay, yeah. so it was not clickbait. And a uh, decisive moment is an expression which is in the quote by Cardinal de Retz, 18th century French, uh, that Cartier Bresson has chosen to open the book. Il n'y a rien dans ce monde qui n'est un moment décisif. So, they thought that maybe they should take this little part of the sentence as a title in America, the decisive moment. The problem with the decisive moment is that this expression is not false, but it's really narrow because there is not one decisive moment. There are hundreds, thousands of decisive moments. And also there is not the right moment. There is your brain, your memories, your thoughts, psychoanalysis, poetry, everything which goes into a photograph. It's not only the moment. That's, that's so true. So Cartier-Bresson has been all his life called the famous photographer of the decisive moment. And he was not happy at all <laughs> with that. Yeah. He was against it. Mm -hmm. And he was always scratching the title of the book when he was signing to, to write something else instead of decisive moment. So that's funny because, of course, these three, three words, these the decisive moments, three words, those three words have been a kind of definition of the way of Cartier-Bresson was shooting, but it's absolutely against his wishes. I, I like this story so much for a number of reasons, but one, because Cartier-Bresson was so much more, as you were saying, than capturing that moment. It was the totality of his life to that point in each and every photograph mm -hmm. that this is what he saw. Mm -hmm. This is how he chose to frame it. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, as a, a member, a founding member of Magnum, he was given assignments, so he didn't shoot just what he wanted to, Although when he was but younger... But this is, was just after the war, because yes. Magnum was created in '47. What you see in this book, half of it is before '47, And it's probably where he has his best pictures. When he was traveling in the 30s, just, he was saying, smiling, uh, not smiling, uh, smelling, smelling. Smelling. And um, renifle, you know. And uh, with no assignment, just traveling with France and doing picture not as a métier, not as a job, but just as a mean of expressing himself. You know, it's now that's interesting because before photography, he chose another medium to express himself. Mm. He wanted to be a painter, like an uncle of his, who enc encouraged him a lot. Louis. Yes, to become a painter, and he followed uh, school in painting and things like that. In fact, he quickly abandoned painting, uh, thinking he could become a filmmaker. Yes, mm -hmm. I love this intersection mm -hmm. of cinema mm -hmm. and still photography. Mm -hmm. It comes up again and again, and certainly that's what's happening right here, right now, because this will be going on YouTube. 
and um, he left for Mexico. In Mexico, he happened to, me to meet with Alvarez Bravo and also Paul Strand. Paul Strand uh, went back to New York. Henri went back to New York. And Paul Strand had created with other guys uh, a company named Nikino, based on yes. the Soviet try of... Um, Soviet of cinema. Yeah, yes. kind of uh, uh, cinema which was uh, political and documentary. Terry cinema, and uh, he teached Henri how to make movies. And uh, just before going back to Europe, Henri Cartier-Bresson made an album of his 60 best pictures, and he sent this album to Louis Bunuel, the and then maker, to yes. Jean Renoir. French and Jean maker. Renoir said to Henri, "Oh, you are good, not bad. Come, you will become my assistant." So he was the assistant of Jean Renoir on three movies, he's even playing in those movies. He, speaking year. roles, speaking yeah, yeah. roles, I'm even very impressed. Li li little yes. speaking role. And um, he made, at the same period, he made two films on the Spanish Civil War. Yes. For Nekino. And a little later, a film uh, at the end of the Second World War. on uh, For the uh, American War Office. Yeah. And uh, finally decided that uh, maybe cinema was too complicated because you have to have a big team and you have to work with uh, too many people. It's a and, pain uh, in the butt. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it was more difficult at the, Much those more days. difficult. And um, it, at the same period, the, the MoMA in New York thinking uh, he had died during the war because as he, as he escaped from prisoner camp in we should, Germany. We should probably just step back a little mm -hmm. bit. So in uh, 1939 or mm -hmm. 1940, mm -hmm. he enlisted yes. in the French army. He was immediately taken as prisoner. Mm -hmm. Not and a very good soldier, I guess. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it, three times he tried to escape. Third time was a good one. And as you, when you have escaped, you have to hide yourself because you are an evadé, how do you call that? Somebody who has been escaping. An yeah. escapee? An escapee. So he's hiding himself. That's why Moma thought he, was, he died during, during the war, in captivity or somewhere. And they wanted to make a posthumous exhibition of his work. Um, but finally, through his good friend David Seymour, Shim, uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson heard about this project of an exhibition at, at Moma. And he said, well, I'm so happy, but you know, I'm still alive. So I, uh, I have many pictures to propose to you. You must not only count on the pictures that were shown at Julien Levy before. I am coming with a new set of pictures, and we'll see. So he went to the States. So that's in the book, Image à la Soviet, where it divides. The second part be begins there with America. And uh, as the show is delayed of a year, he can travel in America. He can take time to make prints with his friend uh, Shim. And uh, just after the opening of his show, Magnum is created. Kappa, Shim, Vendiver, and Cartier-Bresson, who already was not there. He was living for Asia, where he right. stayed until 1951. And that's when he came back from Asia, that the project of this book became really solid and serious. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because before World War II, uh, Cartier-Bresson was the scion of a very affluent family in, in France. And he had the luxury of traveling and feeding his artistic ambitions. Mm -hmm. but. It must have been the case that going through three years in a, a German prisoner of war camp and seeing World War II up and close, it must have changed, and did, it changed what he chose to focus on. Is yes, that fair? Yes, of course, obviously. Because before, he was, tra he was really close to surrealist people. He was traveling like a dreamer, you know. And then three years in captivity, the war, it changed your brain. You have to be more uh, concerned, you have to be more attached to, to defend some va certain values. All this changes you. And that, that's the moment that Magnum was created. And Magnum, at the time, as this 
really good uh, idea that it was to protect photographers and that photographers were the owner of the company and their negatives belong to them and not to the newspaper who was sending them somewhere. So that's how uh, the notion of authorship became really serious. Right. Because the photographer, right. let's for example, George Roger, who also created Magna maybe two months after you, he joined the, the group, George Roger had been a photographer for Life magazine, and he photographed, for example, the, openi the opening of Bergen, Belsen camps, and things like oh, that. Wow. But those pictures doesn't belong to him. They belong to Life magazine because he took them and he was paid by them. So the difference with Magnum is that a photographer at Magnum was asked if he wanted to do a story for Life, but he was owning his negatives. This is so important and it's so interesting because there's a very strong parallel with the film world when yeah. Charlie Chaplin and others created United Artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was artists when was that? taking control of their destiny. That was in the 20s, I ah, think. Yeah. The, the 20s. Mm -hmm. United Artists. Mary Pickford, she was mm -hmm. another one. Yeah. 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 So, so very forward thinking, very forward thinking, very interesting. And I've read that although Cartier-Bresson was the magnum photographer who went to Asia, it wasn't an obvious fit that he would be in Asia as opposed to other photographers, but because of his wife then, Ratna? Yeah, she was from, uh, she was Java, from Javanese. She was a dancer. Uh, and I think she helped him getting some authorization to be able to stay there. But in fact, Cartier-Bresson, uh, was not at all a journalist, but he was kind of interested by decolonization and uh, he smelled that something mm. could be interesting mm. there. But you know, it's, he left in end of 47 and he came back in 51, so it's a very long trip. Yes. You know, it's very rare. Yes, and of course, extraordinary things were happening at, mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the creation of communist China. Yes, of uh, course. Mahatma the Gandhi's end of the Kuomintang. Yes, yeah. the uh, Mahatma Gandhi's assassination. Yes. He was there for all of that. He knew yeah. Gandhi. Because he, he was Nehru. a good smeller. He was a good yeah. smeller. Yeah, he but, knew. It, but, but that's another thing about Bresson that really strikes me. We talk about the decisive moment. I've made the error, I will not make it going forward, <laughs> of, of saying Cartier Bresson decisive moment and that's it, like that's his brand. He was so much smarter than that. But it wasn't just intellect, it wasn't just. Uh, an autodidact. He taught himself. He read. He read Proust, which I've never read. It's apparently 1.3 million words, but we have Google, and I did learn a little bit about it. It's, it's fascinating. Mm. But he also was decisive, I think it's fair to say, in terms of meeting people, in terms of placing himself in these incredible circumstances. I read about a period when he was in Asia where they actually wanted to meet with uh, communist Chinese. And if kidnap is not the right word, I'm not sure what is, but he became their guests for mm -hmm. several months. Mm -hmm. Not more than that, but it was a bit difficult. But you know, when he did uh, this famous picture of uh, uh, the people queuing in China in the front run on of the, the bank. bank. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see the composition in, is fantastic. And it's a huge event. Yes. So, yeah. It strikes me as a convergence of three very different things. An artistic sensibility that he began mm. with painting. Mm -hmm. A social awareness that began with being uh, the product of affluence and at some level turning away from that. And then this commitment to simply showing up, which was not simple at all back in mm. that day. And I understand he didn't like to fly. No. And in fact, he, did, he didn't like to go to live for very short trips, like photographers generally do, live for two days there, three days there. He hated that. Yeah. So that's why he stayed three years in Asia. So it's very know. wearing. And he, a year in Mexico. And you know, th this kind of trips he liked. Yeah. And, and not going for shooting one image. Because, you know, when, he bec when they created Magnum, he was, he was almost 40, 39 exactly. Old man. And he already had three exhibitions in New York. 
two at Julian Levy Gallery, one alone, one with Walker Evans and Alvarez Bravo. Incredible. And one retrospective at MoMA. So when they created Magnum and he began to work for magazine, he was already an artist. You know, he was yes. already somebody that was uh, referred as the great photographer, Henri Cartier-Bresson. So he could also decide a bit what he wanted to do. Even if in China, for example, he was obliged to do a few pictures in color because Life magazine wanted a few pictures in color. Yes. Yeah, but he never liked this picture. He never selected them for any book or any retrospective. We, we still have the slides, but we have no authorization to use them. How interesting. Yeah. One of the things that Cartier-Bresson has said any number of times, or said any number of times, is it's not about the equipment. I agree. And yet, it was this small little camera mm -hmm. that allowed him to be inconspicuous in crowds, mm -hmm. that in its day, with just a quick flip, was already on to the next exposure, mm -hmm. whereas before that, it would be a speed graphic, mm -hmm. four by five mm -hmm. inch mm -hmm. sheet film, one at a time. Mm -hmm. And I understand, not only did he not like color, he resented that magazines, when he was commissioned to do color work, told him he had to have a much bigger camera. No, I don't know. The, the Plowbell Machina, uh, a, a I don't format know camera. because uh, this I'm not sure of, but okay. sorry. But uh, no, because uh, it, was, it was not just it at all his way of expressing himself. You know, he liked color a lot with Bonnard or with Matisse. You know, he was he knew those guys and he photographed them and he went to the atelier. So, you know, his favorite painter was Paolo Uccello, you know, and, and it's color. But in photography, he, he, he liked the black and white abstraction. It's also wonderful because you, you mentioned Matisse. Matisse, of course, was the artist commissioned to do, to the, do the cover. cover of the book. And what's, what's fascinating to me is the, the parallel nature. Matisse actually worked with, that was a montage. He literally would yeah, cut cutting. out. Yes, Mat and, Matisse cutting. And in the 20s, montage in photography uh -huh. was a big uh -huh. deal. But at the end of his life, Matisse was doing a lot of cuttings, paper cuttings, also because he could not paint anymore. Uh -huh. So he was, he was doing cuttings. And I understand that later in life, Cartier-Bresson returned to painting himself? Yeah. Later in life, uh, in, at the end of the 60s, he didn't want to, to do reportage anymore. So he told Magnum, you can, you can still have my archive and distribute my archive, but I don't want to do assignment anymore. And um, because, in fact, he wanted to go back to drawing. And when I knew Cartier-Bresson in, in the 80s, he was every morning going to draw either in Le Louvre, either in his atelier with models. And he keeps saying, I have so many things to learn. And he was almost 80. Well, so he was doing that until his, his death, in fact. Curiosity mm -hmm. is what drives us. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned going to the Louvre. Mm -hmm. Before we came on camera, you told me a little story about that because you were saying, yeah, he would go to the Louvre and draw. And I said, well, yeah, that was before it was crowded. <laughs> and you had a rather interesting mm -hmm. response to that. I wonder well, if you In fact, as also because he was Cartier-Bresson, he knew a lot of people at, at Le Louvre. And at the time, Le Louvre were, was closed one day a week. I think it was Tuesday. Maybe it's still closed on Tuesday. I don't know. And uh, he, w he, he was capable of going when it was closed. And he was sometimes staying two, three hours in front of a painting he loved, drawing it, copying it. With no one else? With no one else, yeah. To me, that is luxury. Yeah, yeah, sure. That is luxury. Yeah. Well, let's but talk also about... also, a person as known as he was, sometimes is not at all interested by painting. She would be more interested by, I don't know, cars, or, you know, things like that, or golf, or tennis, or... He was interested yes. by painting. Yes, but he had that intellectual yeah. curiosity mm -hmm. from early, early on, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is, is so interesting mm -hmm. to me. You know, when he left for Africa in 1932, I think, he left for a year in Africa. And he left for Africa with two books, Sandra and Ulysses 
James Joyce just translated into French. Hmm. And he could he could read English pretty well. So you know, he left his uh, his what he's 23, 24 with the two very important book of the time for a year in Africa. Mm. Fantastic. Mm. I, I the only people I know who would actually take the time to read books like that are my daughters. Oh yeah? Good. Yes. Good yes. for you. My daughters don't read. <laughs> <laughs> I don't read like that anymore. Instead I just get on the phone every morning. Oh yeah. That's what I do. So I want to ask you what is probably a terrible question because I'm going but I'm going to ask it anyway. And then I'm going to ask for your help in uh, pronunciations. Mm -hmm. uh, so the pronunciations that I, I want help with are uh, three of my favorite, I'll tell you my favorites first. Mm -hmm. uh, the, is it San Lazar? Lazare? San Lazar. San Lazar. Mm -hmm. it's, you guys know this and we'll, we'll show it right mm -hmm. now. It's the man jumping, jumping across. Yeah. It's fantastic. There is a big story about this picture. Tell us the story, please. Um, when he left for, for New York to prepare his exhibition at MoMA, he made a scrapbook with 380 or 40 and 400 prints inside this album. So he printed himself those 400 prints. He printed it himself. Yes. I understand he didn't like printing. No, but it was the war and uh, he had to prepare a selection to show to the people at MoMA for his exhibition. Okay. So he took, I think, the boat with his scrapbook under uh, his arm. So he had been editing all what he has been doing since the 30s to 1945 or 6. And he discovered this picture, Saint Lazare. That was made in 32, but never printed, because it's a picture that he cropped. And Cartier-Bresson was somebody who was never cropping his pictures, because he was thinking that either the picture is good, either it's bad. But it's the, the eye you know, the, the, the mind's eye. So he, he, doesn't, he didn't want to cut it and to try to do something else. But this picture, which is amazing, it took only one, not two, one. It was, there were a fence. And his, the length of his leg I could not go in between the two pieces of wood. So when he took the picture, there is a piece ah. of wood a, appearing in the, in the picture on the left side. So as he didn't want, he was not a cropping guy, it was not interesting. And then he looked at it again and saw that if he was cropping the picture, taking out the piece of wood, it would be a masterpiece. And it is a masterpiece. It is, it is. And in the, the scrapbook, we did the publication of this scrapbook, we have the two versions. We have the version cropped and the version with no cropping. I am fascinated by this because there is a school of thought that says the composition is the composition, that's it. I've heard, I've read that he was much like that. And yet, I know that this is not the only time that he cropped. Two, three times. Uh, and, yeah. and he also did something else which I was not aware of until I went back in and started going through Henri Cartier-Bresson, The Modern Century, mm -hmm. which was the book mm -hmm. coming out of 2010 mm -hmm. uh, MoMA retrospective. MoMA, yeah. There were two images. One of a woman, the camera is looking up at her, and her earrings have been removed wife, from yeah. the shot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there is, uh, we would call that Photoshop today. Mm. And there is another shot of, I think it was a shirt, hanging on a clothesline mm -hmm. where he removed the clothes pins. Yeah, this was just his youngest uh, uh, tries in the surrealism period. And André Breton uh, was uh, needing pictures to illustrate an article in his magazine. So he, he said to everybody, do, do something for me with a piece of material. So it was like uh, students at huh. school trying to huh. do things to illustrate an article for André Breton. Fascinating. So it's different because it was really experimentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you because now having circled back, I know that it's Saint Lazar. Uh, Lazar. Saint Lazar. Saint Lazar. Yes. Another one of my absolute favorite photographs, and I, I actually don't remember the title of it. It begins with an H. Is of course where he's shooting from above. There is a set of stairs, a black rail, and a bicycle is a blur mm -hmm. coming yeah. around the corner. Yeah. How is that pronounced? Yeah, is a yeah, yeah is a city in the south of France. 
Okay. Well, yeah, you know what? Small actually, city. I'm going to stop telling you about my favorites. Okay. But I am going to ask you about yours. Is well, that I don't it? have. You don't have. No. Okay. Impossible. Oh, fair enough. Too many. <laughs> fair enough. I understand. <laughs> well, a little bit about you before we sign off. How did you come to be the director of the Henri Cartier Bresson Foundation? Um, in fact, I spent 20 years at Magnum Photos, and uh, I was kind of art director there. And uh, I was most of my time there. I was in charge of uh, Cartier Bresson because Cartier Bresson didn't want to have 20 people, that all the full team calling him every day because are you do you agree with that? Do the, he wanted to have only one person, and I was that person. And when his wife, Martin Franck, also a Magnum photographer, decided to do this foundation, it was just a period in 2002 when I wanted to, do a, to take a sabbatic year. And finally, the project I had for this sabbatic year fell down, and Martin Franck asked me if I wanted to, uh, to help her with the foundation, let's say a week per month or something like that. So I said yes. And I didn't know if I wanted to go back to Magnum or to do something else. And Martin offered me to work at the foundation. Uh, they already had a director, Robert Delpier, the famous French publisher, but he was pretty old. He was almost 80, I think. And uh, Martin knew that he would do that for the opening. And then, so, I decided that I could be the deputy director for a few months and then become the director when he, he stops. And that's what happened. And uh, for 15 years, I have been the director for maybe 12 years with Martin Franck as president. And it was a fantastic collaboration. It was, we, we created this foundation together. And it was great. And then since uh, three months, I have decided to uh, stop, to do a step by, step back. Step back. And uh, to become only the artistic director. And uh, we have asked to Francois Ebel, that you met, good friend of mine, to become the director. So we work as a team now. Well, on the one hand, it's sad, but on the other hand, it doesn't sound sad at all. It sounds exciting. No, no it's, not, it's my decision, and it's fine. No problem. If you were the art director, and now you're stepping back to mm -hmm. be artistic director again, I'm guessing that you're an artist yourself. I don't know. I don't think so. I think I'm very sensitive to artists. Uh, I grew up in a family of artists. And uh, um, I'm interested by photography, but it is not what I'm interested in the most. I much prefer literature or painting ah. than photography. But it happens that in photography, I have uh, knowledge quite serious since 30 years. I would say, <laughs> but, yes. uh, but you know, I think it's good not to be uh, focused on one medium. They inform each other, do mm -hmm. they not? Mm -hmm. Yes. What course. kind of literature do you enjoy? Hmm. Many. Post, of course. Yes. <laughs> yes. I read it from the beginning to the end. It took me three years, but I read it. I was going completely. to ask, yeah. was it worth it? Oh, fantastic, yeah. It's, it's said that it is the greatest mm -hmm. uh, novel ever written, certainly mm -hmm. the longest, twice as long as Dr. Zhivago. I don't know, I have no idea, but it's, uh, it's a very long process. It's a life thing, you know. But uh, no, I read many kinds of literature. I'm also, I'm a teacher in philosophy, in fact, at the, at the beginning. And I'm very much interested also in theori theoretical texts. Interesting. Uh, and I'm going to be the director of a collection of textbooks in France soon. Beautiful. So because uh, for me, reading is something very important. I understand. <laughs> well, Anya, thank you so much for sitting yeah, down welcome. with us. What a privilege. What <laughs> a pleasure. You tell me when I can see that. Yes, we'll I will. <laughs> I will. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone here with Anya Sir, now the soon to be stepping back artistic <laughs> director of Henri Cartier Bresson Foundation. See you next time. Stop futzing with the thing. I was sitting there to take it out.